Thank you very much. Welcome to the June 8th Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Uh, can we take a roll call, oh, please? Ms. Shoup? Here. Mr. Richard? Here. Mr. Hebert? Here. Mr. Maroon? Here. Mr. Stark? Here. Mr. Crockett? Here. And Mr. Blaze? Here. Full staff. Awesome. Okay, very good. Uh, let's stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have a couple of minor changes. We've got. What's the wrong video? Oh, right here. We 2576, uh, appeal number 2576, a variance appeal from uh, Charlie and Lisa Lee, 47 Windsor Lahoma Road, has been asked to be tabled or taken off. Withdrawn. 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 So that's been withdrawn. It will not be rescheduled unless they choose to bring it back up and then they have to do the regular paperwork again. So we have two appeals tonight that we need to do with. And the minutes. So do I have a motion on the minutes of May 12, 2016? Motion to approve as presented. Second. Discussion on the motion? I had a question, a clarification. Sure. sure. Um, at the end of the decision we made for Bailey's Restaurant, we said that the electric and water line could not be connected because it wasn't inspected. Mm -hmm. So they have lights there now. Does that mean they've been inspected and they're up, they did it? I guess that's a question for Brian. <laughs> Are they allowed to do it, or were they banned uh, from doing it? I was it? not. I was not aware that there were lights there. I was not yeah. aware that they had them hooked up. Yeah, pretty quickly. We'll be paying a visit. Okay. I didn't know if we were saying you can't do it at all, or. Uh, well, actually, that's a good question. I want to qualify that. We'll look into that after the fact. My understanding, if okay. I remember correctly, was that it needed to come back if they were going to do that. But I may have misread what I signed. So I don't have it. I haven't seen it in 30 days. So. No, they didn't come back. They didn't come back. And was it required that they did come back? I don't remember. I'm, qu I'm quite sure too that it was represented that they were no that it was never connected. None of the none of the underground utility was ever connected. That's right. It was. Uh, that was the impression that, uh, and I don't. The rest of the board yeah. members that were here. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's I hard. I, I drive it. by it. They have posts up with the electrical outlets and stuff, and now they have lights up in the tent. Um, are they connected to those posts, or do they just run? I mean, while dri I mean, I didn't do an inspection. Right. So driving by. Uh, well, well, we should look. Yeah. At Thank you. Yeah. Next, I think part of it we had said that utilities and water would not um, be hooked up. I just want to throw something at the board on this subject. This has obviously been a trend. Um, I'd like to suggest that, if necessary, the we we as a, a board support uh, the zoning uh, the the. Um, having the authority to make the decision to at least start the process of finding if they don't start to, to fall in line immediately and so that they understand that we as a board are taking a position that we've had enough uh, and I, I think that uh, just saying don't do that does not seem to work so I'm not taking a vote on it I'm looking for comments from the board number one I don't think we have the authority to vote on it I think it's a town matter but I want the board to take a position on it if they choose Anybody have a different opinion than that? No, I'd, I'd have to agree with that, especially when it was uh, items that we specifically talked about. And uh, I would like uh, Brian and his staff to go through and, and take a look at the wording that we put on there. I know for a fact that uh, that the water was part of that. I don't remember what we did on the on the electrical was too. If the electrical was part of it, then absolutely. Anybody else have any comments? Okay. So as, as the board, uh, we believe you should have the authority and recommend you do whatever is necessary mm -hmm. to, and uh, I'm sure they may come back with an administrative appeal. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because I want the board to have a free opinion of this if they choose to come back as an administrative a point of clarification on that. Um, if, if we are able to ascertain that it was installed properly and they get the proper permits and uh, it would probably require an affidavit from a licensed electrician at this point um, and an after the fact permit 
is the board okay with them using the electrical or is it not to be connected? I, Period. I understood that I needed to come back if they were going to do anything whatsoever, so I would say Needed no. to come back to the board. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I would say they're in violation. It's intentional. Okay. Whether, by, whether intent or accidentally intentionally, it's the same place. Um, Happy accident. Yeah. Yeah, so, and, and this isn't the first. So I understand by saying this, though, from the board's point of view, if they do come back, we've taken a position, not a firm position, not a voted position, but they probably will come back as an administrative appeal. That's why I did what I did. I just want everybody to be aware of my intention, okay? Um, that being said, we'll jump in. Any, oh, do I, we have a, any other comments on the no, Thank you for catching that. Uh, we have a motion and second? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes. And any more discussion on Do we need to amend that or just nope, for discussion? Just okay. observation, yeah. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Good. And abstain? No abstention. Oh, Mr. Chairman. You were trying to tell me something before the meeting started. What? Oh, I didn't. He doesn't have appeal number one. I didn't have appeal number one, but I realized <coughs> I had it in my packet, but he missed the last meeting. So. That's the penalty for missing the meeting. <laughs> Here, you can, you can look on with me. You got to look on. You're lucky that's all it is, too. <laughs> I just didn't know if there were any others. I feel like I've been let off easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It could be so much worse. <laughs> I did keep mine, so I went back and found it. Uh, he can have mine if you want. He's, he's looking at mine, so. Okay. He's not going to end up being a voting member anyway, so. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we got appeal number uh, 2572, which is administrative appeal from uh, Craig Pooler, 20, 223 Gorham Road, Justice Map R37, parcel 17. And is there a representative for Mr. Pooler? Mr. Pooler here? Yes, sir. Could you take the microphone, please? State your name, address, and. I'll give us a brief overview. Uh, we'll start from there. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Craig Fuller. Um, I'm the owner and operator of Taylor and Lawn Care um, from the location of 223 Gorm Road in Scarborough uh, for approximately the last 20 plus years. Um, uh, Brian Longstaff had approached me and said that I was not in compliance with the zoning in that area, which was basically not allowing outside storage. Um, I've supplied some information here tonight for you folks. Uh, I feel as I fall well within the grandfather clause. Um, I've shown you some taxes that I've been paying on business equipment since 2005. Uh, the registration, if you notice on the copies of the registration, they only go back to 2010 uh, in the registration area. Obviously, it was way back. In 99, I think, was one of my first vehicles that I registered here. But they only go back that fast. So that's why that, if you see that stop in 2010, that's the only reason why that stops there. Um, and then, obviously, you can see there's some other issues there as far as neighbors. Um, they have all written some affidavits in my behalf. Um, I feel as though I should be well within the grandfather law and clause. Um, but I welcome any questions or concerns where this should be. Uh, just for the record, uh, Mr. Poole called me about uh, the day or two before last meeting, and uh, I actually suggested if he chose to, if he wanted to withdraw and come this meeting, I think I did disclose that last time, uh, to do such. So just want to remind everybody that I did have that conversation with him. Thus, that's why we're here. Um, okay. So let me, why don't I um, start off by Mr. Longstaff, if you can give us an overview of what has transpired from the town's point of view and the town's position. <coughs> yes, Mr. Poole is correct. Does he have one of these for Mr. Poole? Um, I don't believe he does, no. They have one of okay. Um, Mr. Poole is correct. When, when uh, the Poolers experienced a fire uh, back in 2014 uh, or 15, now I can't remember. There you go. It's going to be forever in your memory. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so when we started to work with the Poolers on their rebuild project, um, I mentioned to Mr. Pooler that the outside storage was going to be an issue. And, but we kind of pushed it aside while they got the other details of their project figured out and there, there was some 
other issues with the building as far as whether it was going to be a four unit building or two unit building and how much storage there was going to be inside the garage and so on and so forth so we we kind of delayed um, doing anything about the outside storage that had been going on for um, several years um, at that point when it came close to getting time to have a certificate of occupancy um, we started to delve into the issue in earnest and um, we asked Mr. Pooler to bring us in any evidence that he had that this use had existed prior to any zoning ordinance in Scarborough um, or prior to any amendment to the zoning ordinance which then made the outside storage non-conforming. Um, so Mr. Pooler brought in basically what you see in front of you, the uh, registration, some letters from vendors, uh, suppliers, um, and so on and so forth um, and appreciated his effort but it didn't give me any evidence on which I could say yeah the business definitely existed prior to any zoning uh, ordinance or amendment and um, I went back into the files went back <coughs> to the earliest ordinance I could find in 1958 um, which time it was sort of inconclusive what the use was at that location at the time or what it was zoned for at that at that time um, but I subsequently found a map that showed that it was an R2 residential district and it was an R2 district at least into the mid 90s 1990s um, and I have a map here one of the old zoning maps that shows you know pass that along I kind of flagged the area is in the triangle there at the uh, where Eight Corners Market is, just just uh, north and west of that. So you can see that the zoning district <coughs> in that area is R2. That's 1952. That's 1991. Oh. That's 1991. I could have brought that one up, but I didn't. <laughs> but it was residential all yeah. during that those years, Not from the there. time we first had zoning until 19, at least 1991, and I, I believe that map was still in effect in 1996. I brought a copy of the 1996 zoning ordinance, um, which I think I made reference to in my letter to Mr. Pooler. Um, and, and at that time, if it was in fact an R2, as that map suggests, the outside storage is not a permitted use. It's not listed here as a permitted use. It's not listed as a special exception use. So it's just not permitted in the R2. I also looked in the business districts, and it's still not listed as a permitted use in any of the business districts. So no matter what, the zoning was at that lot in 1996, which is 20 years backwards from now, and that's the sort of the reference point that keeps coming up in Mr. Pooler's evidence that he's been there for at least 20 years. It's it's been a residential district or a TVC3 district, so it's in either one, it's not a permitted use. So, and the specific I, issue we're talking about is storage. The outside, outside storage. storage at, right. Yeah, we we feel that the business use as a um, as a landscaping uh, and yard maintenance business is is a business service which is a permitted use in the town village center three that's that's not the issue it's the fact that like most landscapers you've got equipment you've got lawn mowers you've got earth materials and maybe some stone and some mulch and some topsoil or whatever you've got mowers and and rakes and maybe a bobcat or you know so it all of that stuff if there's no outside storage that stuff has to be contained inside if you don't want to contain it inside you need to be in the industrial district because that's the only district other than a few districts that allow it as a special exception which would then have to come to the Board of Appeals for approval um, this isn't one of the, the TVC3 isn't one of those districts I think the B3 is um, but that the industrial district would allow you to have that stuff outside it allows contractor yards it allows all those things this district tvc3 does not allow that type of business however it's still a business service it can exist and if you had a building where you can tuck all that stuff in you can operate out of that um so that's that's kind of where we stand uh, i made mention of i i contacted a, a former uh, code enforcement officer for the town of scarborough who had worked for the town for 10 or 12 years and uh, tom rainsboro and he mentioned that you know when he first started there were maybe a, there was maybe a trailer and some snow sleds and some other things going on there and from time to time it would escalate and ramp up and then they'd go talk to mr pooler and some of the materials would go away and everything would calm down and 
he asked the planning department um, if they wanted to, you know, bring uh, Mr. Pooler in and go through site plan review, and nobody seemed to uh, want to pursue that at the time, so it just sort of kept going, and as things were busy, we had bigger fish to fry, we just pursued other things. So he's, he was aware of it, um, but he said it was not that way when he first, it's not like it is today when he first started working here. And I passed you all each out a copy of that email. For those of you who don't know Tom, he's very, very thorough, yeah. uh, strong code. Also, I mean, if anybody's not familiar, I should have made copies of this, I forgot to. Um, there's just a few photos that I snapped, so you can see kind of what, what goes on with the poolers, uh, with the Taylor Dunn landscaping operation, the type of outside storage and equipment that we're talking about. Um, you know, and, and, and I know since I've been here in 2013, um, I've, I've noticed the equipment there. I've noticed, you know, the, um, the materials there. I assumed that it was a permitted or grandfathered use, but in all my research, I can't see where Mr. Pooler ever applied for a permit uh, to conduct the business there. I can't find any evidence, um, you know, of any approvals for any, anything that he's doing there. So therefore, grandfathering only applies to something that was permitted at one time, but then because of the adoption of an ordinance or the amendment of an ordinance became non-conforming. That's the only time that you can say it's grandfathered. So we would need to have, in this case, hard proof that Taylor Dunn existed at that lot without cessation since 1958 or before. That's, that's where we stand. I can't find any, any evidence, and I haven't been provided any evidence to that, to that effect. So that's why we're here. It's not that, you know, it's, it, it's for no other reason other than it's a non-conforming use, which we'd like to try to deal with and get straightened out rather than to continue to perpetuate a non-conforming use. I've got other businesses who want to do the same thing, who I'm saying, no, outside storage is not permitted. So fair is fair. We've got to play it even, and that's where we stand. Thank you. Mr. Longstamp, is, um, back when it was an R2, mm -hmm. was that a permitted use with special exception? No. Okay, <coughs> thank you. No. Mr. Poole, would you like to respond to anything that uh, Mr. Um, Poole Yeah, there's a couple things. Um, the and grandfather that, and, law... And, and please direct it to, to me, not Mr. Longstaff, okay, strictly to me. Okay. okay. Um, the grandfather law that I googled does not specify that. I guess maybe if you, depends how you want to read it. Um, grandfather law, the way I understood it, is a, something that has been continually run and it doesn't even give you a time period, whether it be five years, 10 years, 20 years. If it's been run like that, why, why has it been run like that for 22 years? And now, finally, it's being approached. Um, that's one issue. The other issue is Tom. I have never met this man. This man has never spoke to me. And I would really love to have him here tonight because this is not true. And even if it was true, he spoke to me, but he let this run for 12 years when he was in here and never did anything about it. That I think that's very unfair. If there was an issue then he needed to find time within his 12-year tender to approach this subject. I think it's kind of like ill timing to, to come back and, oh, I saw it for 12 years, but I just didn't have time to do anything about it. I'm trying to just read in here if he said that he saw it or he was, I don't, I don't talk to you directly, uh, or just was making observations. Um, And also, you can also refer back to my tax bill that I've been receiving since 2005. So that definitely falls within that 12-year tender of Tom. And if you look, I was paying taxes on three mowers, several weed whackers, backpack blowers. So Tom's saying he only saw a mower and a snowmobile trailer. Well, I've been paying taxes on equipment I probably shouldn't have then, I guess, because it didn't exist. It's been there since 2005, and before. But I'm just, you know, that's what I've got records of. 
I don't know. I didn't look at them. Okay. Anything else you wish to add to that? Um, and then the only other approach that I, uh, that I would like to mention is that 22 years ago, there was no such thing as needing permits for this stuff. I mean, I understand today you can't even have a yard sale without a permit. And I understand there's reasons for that. Same thing as reasons for me needing a permit to run a business. But set yourself back 22 years ago. It's not that I purposely didn't get one, didn't know I needed one. Nobody approached me and told me I needed a permit. Tom never approached me and told me to clean the yard up. I would have cleaned the yard up. I've got no problem with that. In fact, Brian did mention at one point that, you know, the yard was a little in the shambles. I immediately cleaned everything up out front and tried to get as much around the back side of the garage as I could. Because, again, I don't mind trying to comply, but I was never asked prior to okay. six, approximately six to eight months ago. Thank you. This is a little bit embarrassing, but I was actually on the board in 1997. Which is about 22 years ago. <laughs> Just to give you an idea. That Hate yourself now. <laughs> we did have ordinances. We did have rules because we were here. I, I just want to respond. A little to embarrassing. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, first thing, Craig. I mean, I can't. I all I'm doing is going by this email. Tom says that he visited the site. I don't know if he spoke to you or if he spoke to someone who worked with you or if he spoke to your mother. 22 years ago, well, not 22 years, 12 years ago, I don't know. You know, I can't remember who I talked to last week. So if you can re specifically remember that you never talked to Tom, so be it. But it's, it's his word against your word. That's, that's, what I'm, that's all I'm saying about it. I, I don't even, I honestly, Tom, but he does say that you, I wouldn't even recognize But he does, and, and it's my turn to talk now, okay? My turn to talk. I need people with me. Um, so he does say that from time to time it would escalate. So obviously he was aware that more equipment, more materials got there. He would go and talk to you, and it would calm down, as you as you yourself said. So I mean, I think that I think I think it's a it's a bit of a contradiction to say that you never were approached by him because how would you know to tone it down if somebody didn't ask you to? If you did I never toned it down, sir. No, once I I, it's my down. turn to talk, okay? I've got to get my uh, rebuttal out, okay? Then you can talk. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. So, so he says, uh, the grandfather moved out of this property 25 years ago. He was not doing anything more than parking his mo mower and snowmobiles in the yard and garage. When I started in Scarborough, he did not ask any questions about what he could or could not do, would clean things up when we spoke to him prior to Tom uh, Hall. Uh, being town manager. Um, he said, of the multitude of bad actors, corner, corner of Beach Ridge and Gorham, corner of Spring and Route 22, paving guy on County Road, Crystal Springs, contractor on Mussey near South Portland Line, um, and many more. Um, I think what he's trying to say there, that there was a lot of other fish to fry, so they were pursuing those ones. We did get some of those cleaned up, by the way. So, you know, that's, that's all Tom's saying. I, 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 can't, I can't verify it. I can't deny it. I'm just going by what he told me. I asked for his, his recount on why it happened. And basically what he's saying is they weren't getting support from the town manager to pursue these violations that were out there. They were to do the permits, do the inspections and, and carry on and stop bothering people. That was their marching orders, according to Tom. And that's, that's why you weren't approached. As for your comment about 22 years ago you didn't need a permit, that's not true. It's simply not true. I said I didn't know I needed one. That, I believe you. But it's, it's not true that you didn't need a permit. Okay? It may be true that nobody told you you needed a permit and nobody stopped to talk to you. But Permits have been required for business uses for a long time. Site plan review by the planning board has been required for a long time, long, long before 22 years ago. So I just want to clear that up. I don't want any misconceptions I was on the board about that. Was here, so. so you should be able to back that's that statement up. That's, that's all I'm saying. This is not a personal attack. This is simply trying to administer the zoning ordinance that we have in place, which does deal with non-conforming uses. There is no such thing as a grandfather law. Grandfather is simply a term used to describe something that existed 
legally at one time but is now not legally existing because of a change in an ordinance. It's only a term. There is no such thing as a grandfather law. Okay? Mr. Lonsta? Yes. Do you think that maybe, and I, I drive by all the time because I go down that road for different business reasons, do you think it's become more visible or predominant now because the landscape isn't really there and it was before and maybe the landscape was hiding some of what was being stored there so it didn't stick out as much as it may now? I think if you look at the aerial photos that Mr. Pooler provided, in fact, I think in your packets, did they get the Google, the, uh, Google pages, Karen? Yeah, yeah. There you go. So I don't think there was a whole lot of vegetation or landscaping. I, re I remember more than this there now. It, there could have been. There yeah. was uh, there was seven pine trees. Yeah. And they all died of a tapeworm. Yeah. So I think some of that may mm -hmm. not have been as visible as it is now. So, and, and that's a valid point. And it, it may have been a reason as why. As things change so yeah. and things are hidden, or as things migrate to the front of the lot from the back of the lot, sometimes this stuff comes comes to light. And I've often, I've often told people, you know, if we can't see it and your neighbors can't see it, we don't know it's there, then it can exist illegally for a long, long time. We, we mainly respond to complaints. In your case, we were dealing with you because of your burned building and your rebuild project, and that's why we wanted to take care of this. One other thing I will note, um, there was a letter of support from uh, a neighbor of yours, um, I guess we'll Nan, Nanny Stovall, Nan Stovall, um, and, and that's nice, but I do want to tell the board that Nan Stovall did come and see me um, about the, the mulch storage in the yard and the smell of the mulch storage in the summertime. She was very polite and very apologetic and, and certainly did not want to you know, tell tales out of school. She didn't want to get anyone in trouble. She simply couldn't stand the smell of the mulch. <laughs> in the yard and she wanted to know if that was if there was anything that could be done about that. So although she support she's obviously a good neighbor and appreciates everything you do for her and that's great, uh, she did have a concern at that time um, about the mulch storage. So there's you know, there's one thing and that was one of the reasons why I brought it up to you about the outside storage at the time that I did. That was the first indication that a neighbor maybe had a problem with it. It's a good time to try to fix it. Uh, in conclusion with that, her husband, Jim Stovall, came to me two days prior to last month's meeting and offered his help. Okay. I did not solicit him. I did that's, not go up and ask okay. him. So I don't know husband and wife and what's going on, but he came to me and offered. The good news is that's, that's all kind of irrelevant. And I, and I can tell you one thing, other, just from the board's point of view, uh, Mr. Ramsborough's uh, information is nice, but because it's in writing, it's strictly hearsay. So from a legal point of view, it has no value. It's informational. But from a legal point of view, there's no value. That might help you right. a bit, but it still is informational. And I do know Tom, and I can tell you that uh, Tom's very outstanding. But from a, from a <coughs> legal point of view, it, it's strictly hearsay. And just to clarify, I did not say 22 years ago I did not need a permit. I said... 22 years ago when I started, I did not know I needed a permit. Fair enough. I didn't say you didn't need one. Fair enough. Fair I, need enough. You, I, need you to, I need you to come to me, okay? Yeah. It, it's, it's because it's really not about him. His well, job he was directing it to me. I'm just directing okay. it back to him. It's, <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's strictly his job is to, re, to do the best he can to meet the law. My job is to, and you're doing a great job. If you're, if you're not upset, you should be. Because it's your business. <laughs> totally respect that. And, and you know, and trust me, you've never seen anybody nastier than me when I get mad. So I totally get it. And you're not. You're being very polite. But I want to make sure it stays that way. Sure. Okay. Um, I do have some letters. I'm going to open the public hearing. Would anybody like to speak to this uh, issue from the public? And if you would, just take your microphone, state your name, address, and uh, we can go from there. My name is Craig Frederick. I live at 1 LC Way. Frederick, is that right? Yes. Thank you, sir. Spelled Friedrich. Uh, I, Craig just asked me to tell you uh, he has done work for my neighbors who wrote a letter, and I actually went and looked at some old check registers and expenditure risks for my house, and I was able to confirm today that he's been working 
uh, as a lawn care business since 1995. I don't have any spreadsheets before that, and for whatever it's uh, worth. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Uh, my name is Matthew Corbo, and Craig is my uncle. Um, I started landscaping like freshman year in high school, working for him out of my grandmother's house. He'd pick me up at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We'd work for like the last four hours down at Bailey's campground, and I'd get a ride back. I'd shovel snowstorms, sleep on the couch at my grandmother's house at that address in the middle of the night when I needed to catch some sleep and then go back out in the morning and work again. I used to walk from my grandmother's house, which is where the shop was after work, to go roller skating at the Happy Wheels before it was VIP, before Cumberland Farms was there. Just pointing my, just point, getting my point across that the building has been used for those uses for a very, very long time, and it's kind of sad that it comes up at this point when our family went through such a tragic thing. But that aside, I just feel like something should have been said a long time ago. I mean, it's in plain sight. It's on 114. It's at eight corners. Everyone knows that corner. Everybody brings their kids to school there as they grow up why it's getting brought up now my personal opinion is that it's personal and that's what I think it's about I don't think it's about the zone I don't think it's about the town's ordinances I think it's personal between two people that's just my opinion on that thank you very much thank you did you speak uh, Corbo C-O-R-B-E-A-U and your address is I live in Buxton 23 Cross St. Brook okay thank you thanks all right, so anybody else wish to speak? Okay, I'll read in some of the letters that we've received. Um, I'm go by date. The first one is Robert Albert. This is June 8, 2016. To whom it may concern. I purchased bulk, uh, bark mulch and loam each year from Mr. Craig Pooler of Taylor Dunn Lawn Care, Incorporated, located in Scarborough, Maine. I began buying from Taylor Dunn Lawn Care in 2009 when I observed bulk march mulch being stored outside outdoors for sale with a sign near the road on the business property located at 233 Gorham Road, Scarborough. Attaches the evidence of one example of when I bought mulch from Mr. Pooler in 2015. In addition to stored bark mulch, I have observed Taylor Dunn Lawn Care Incorporated dump trucks and other landscape equipment uh, parked outside the building at this location since 2009. In closing, I support Mr. Pooler's business activity at 233 Gorm Road and request your favorable consideration of his application. Robert Albert of 15 Lillian Way, uh, Scarborough. And uh, he provides uh, some cancel checks just from uh, 2015 of uh, doing some, some work. I can't read the last one. That's, I can't read the date on this one. It's May 1st, 2015. 2015. Okay, so. Uh, the next one, is, this is from Michael DiPietro, uh, no address listed. Uh, take it back. I'm a resident of 275 Gorham Road in Scarborough, Maine, and I've been many years, uh, and for many years I am also a local sales rep, spending a great deal of time traveling through Scarborough. I would like to address the issue of a local landscaping company by the name of Taylor Dawn Lawn Care and their past, present, and future use of the property at the Gorham Road to be used to store equipment for their business. Through my many trips daily up and down Gorham Road, I can say that Taylor Dunn Lawn Care has used this property for parking of trucks and storing vehicles, uh, vi I'm sorry, various pieces of equipment used in their business for at least 20 years. Anybody that has knowledge of the area or has ever even stopped by the Eight Corners Market for Lunch has to be aware that this is nothing new and has been in place for storage for a long time. I urge the town of Scarborough to be understanding of the importance of this company to uh, be able to continue using the property for such needs. As a resident of the town, I think it would be a welcome decision to work with a small local business owner. And, uh, the next one is from uh, Brian Gulen. I, uh, Brian Gulen Sr., have worked. Uh, I'm sorry, I think it's uh, yeah, Gulen or Gulen? Yeah, Gulen. I have worked uh, for for Craig Pooler at Taylor Dunn Lawn Care, located at 223 Gorham Road, Scarborough, Maine, between the years of 1999 to 2007. During my employment, 
and still to this day, the company had always stored all of its equipment and materials on the premises, sincerely. Next one is to a main concern. I am Jenny Coriandi of 14 Spring Street, Scarborough, Maine. I've been here for 48 years. I've witnessed Craig Poole's business equipment here next door for the past 20 years. Jenny Coriandi. Next letter is from James and Ann Stovall, 225 Gorham Road. I am writing on behalf of Mr. Craig Poole, 223 Gorham Road. We've known Craig since he was about eight years old. His father had an excavation business at the same location as the business Craig now runs. Unfortunately, Craig's father passed away when Craig was still a child. Craig has worked very hard throughout his life. While many kids were engaged in teenage activities, Craig was working like an adult to help his family. He has had this business at the same location since he was 16 years old, and we as his closest neighbors could not be more proud or supportive of his honest, hard-working man. His business helps take care of the elderly mother, and the kindness he has shown our family is nothing short of amazing. My wife and I are now in our 70s. Craig and his crew has, without, uh, without being asked, plowed us during each, storm, each winter storm, further he has done spring and fall cleanups, and cut our lawn for no charge. He does it out of pure kindness. This is the caliber, the man before you. Even when I was able to do the aforementioned for myself, we had no problem with his business equipment or crew. We have no complaints or noise or any other complaints. His business makes our neighborhood stronger and more vibrant. We could not be happier to have him and his, and his business next to our property and the fact that his equipment out of our con is no concern to us. Thank you for your consideration, James and Ann Stovall, 225 Quorum Road. That's dated. Uh, I don't see a date on that. There's a picture here. These were, by the way, prior. Thank you. From no, this, no, no. oh, these ones coming. These are recent. Okay. There's a picture here uh, from Google Earth of the property dated June 4th, 2016. So this is prior to the fires, is it? No. no. This is after the. What have I got here? Mm, I'm not sure which. Not sure where they're not showing a date. Is where where is what? There's another one that had a date on it. Are you looking at the Google Earth? 2003. That's just 5 16, 2010. Yeah, in the upper left. Right. Well, in the upper left, left, it's kind of white in in the actual picture. It's hard to see. Okay. We'll take, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah right there. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so 2010. I should look at the cars. Um, all right, so we've got, at that point in time, we've got a vacant lot. Uh, for those, I don't know if you can catch this on camera from above or below or you don't have this on the machine do you? No. Um, no, we just received it today. Okay. <laughs> so this is just one of the worst things in the world that can happen, by the way, and, and really shouldn't even use it, is information that we receive on the day of a meeting. But we have it and we'll respect it. Um, uh, so we've got, uh, from the perspective, uh, there's a row of <coughs> trees in front of 223 Gorham Road. There appears to be a long uh, T-shaped building, three vehicles on the right-hand side. It looks like a, uh, a dirt driveway. It looks like two sheds, another vehicle, and then two or three smaller pieces of equipment. I don't see any mulch or anything, but it does look like there's some small pieces of equipment there. To the back of that is what looks like a boat, which I think has been there since the turn of the century, and two vehicles, and then uh, down on the right-hand side on what would be Spring Street is a single-family home with a driveway that actually goes out to uh, the, uh, what road is that? I'm sorry, that's uh, Paint, is that yeah. Gorham that's Road? Gorham road. And then this is Spring. Spring Street. Yeah. So then uh, across the way is the uh, restaurant. Uh, you can see a corner, not the restaurant, but the grocery store just across the street there. Um, there's another picture. Kevin Maroon, is the, uh, the the property where the boat is and those two cars, is that part of the same property? Uh, it's a separate property. I didn't believe that's a stolen property, isn't it? Is that a stolen property? The property that sits behind you directly in this picture, uh, yeah. the property that sits behind you directly in this picture. Stovall's. That's a Stovall's. Um, I remember Mr. Stovall's, a wonderful man. Um, 
the senior. Um, okay, and then if you look at the next picture, a little bit closer view, you will see, I think, of the same date. Is that correct? It looks like 2003. 2003, so it's a little bit older. Uh, trees yeah, again. that picture, Mr. Chairman, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Go ahead. With all those trees there, it really hid a lot of what was there. Oh, the angle, I agree, but the angle's kind of um, pretty sharp. <coughs> you see the same kind of thing, three vehicles at the property. That was a, how many unit property is, was that before it, at that time? Was it a three unit? Two. The two unit? Yes. So you'd expect to see cars where they're located as it was a two unit. And as you'll see, the Stovall property kind of aligning there uh, at the back. Uh, and you can see uh, Gorm Road, uh, Gorm, right? Mm -hmm. And Can't See Spring. The home beside that, is that's still there. It's no longer there. Yeah. It's still there. Absolutely. That's, uh, yeah. And then uh, in front of it, it looks like, again, two coverings. They don't look like vehicles, but they, they look like some kind of, of either buildings or tarps. I, I don't know what they are. I can't make that out. Uh, again, the negative of getting something at the last minute. Um, okay, along with that, um, this is more information that's tied to the file. Let me come back to the letters. We have some recent letters. Oh, the original letters. So I just read the recent letters. And now this is February. We've got three more letters. Okay, thank you. And these are from the prior Thank you. So here's from another one from tonight, June 8th. To my concern, my name is Jonathan Carr, and I live at two, uh, Elise Way, Scarborough, Maine. I'm writing this letter to let you know that I have been doing business with Taylor Dunn Lawn Care for the last 18 years. He's performed many jobs for me from gutter cleaning, plowing, and lawn care. Jonathan Carr. The next one is O'Donnell Nursery. Uh, Taylor Dunn has been a loyal customer of ours since 1997, buying trees, shrubs, and bulk products. Cecilia Diane Meach, wholesale office manager. Uh, to do make concern, I write this letter uh, to inform the reader that we have been doing business with Taylor Dunn since the second store was opened in uh, Greater Portland, Maine. This is Chad Little Outdoor Equipment, 2003-2004. Uh, Please find attached invoice dated 2014. We have continued to both sell and service products Taylor Dunn has purchased with us through the years and two moves to our current location at Seven Glass Cows. Road in Scarborough. Craig Poole, the owner, is a favorite among my employees and myself. And this is from Art Hughes, uh, general manager of a Chad Little. Do we have that? Uh, yeah. <coughs> and again, this invoice, I uh, apologize to everybody that didn't get it earlier. Uh, Chad Little, and it sold to. Um, uh, dated on uh, 4-2604. Uh, customer pickup sold to t uh, Taylor Dunn, 135 Portland Avenue, Unit 502, Old Orchard Beach, Maine. Uh, shipped to Taylor Dunn, 113 Portland Avenue, Unit 4 at 502, Old Orchard Beach, Maine. Uh, credit to System for Landscape Work performed at 682 Main Street Store. And doesn't have really anything and this is Oak Hill Sitco Gas and Convenience. Uh, uh, this letter is to inform you that Craig Poole, the individual for Taylor Dunn Landscaping, has been doing business here for over 20 years. He buys all of his gas, diesel, K1, and propane for, my, for his business use. He has landscaping, plowing, sanding, etc. for many Scarborough residents as well. Taylor Dunn is locally owned business, and we appreciate him having his account with us, uh, Lisa Brady. Uh, and just, just to kind of clarify a couple of things, because we really are dealing with a couple of different issues here, and I need to separate them. Um, I, I don't think there's any debate that um, Taylor Dunn has been a, a business member of the community since 1999. I don't think there's any debate that they've been a very good business member since 1999. I think the question is really about nothing to do with the quality of the work, the quality of the individual, the quality of the town's representatives through the process, including Mr. Longstaff, the quality of any of that. The issue is strictly whether or not, and it's to the point of what was that we're dealing with, whether or not the zoning laws and rules of the state of Maine and Scarborough allow for outdoor um, storage at this location. And I have not made any opinion or taken a position on the issue of 
of um, uh, grandfathering intentionally because, again, uh, grandfathering, depending on what you look at, uh, could mean a variety of things. I did not check the state's website. I did not check Wikipedia or the uh, Onion News. I don't know if the town has anything listed. I didn't see anything in here. Uh, so there's a variety of definitions for that, and I don't find a definition in the town's definition. Um, so that being said, let me open it to the uh, board for questions of uh, any of the individuals here and of uh, Mr. Longstaff through me, please. And we'll go from there. Yes. Mr. Chair, I just took a few minutes and I used my phone, which I probably shouldn't have done while we're meeting. But um, I just wanted to check because there was mention of the business location and I, and I went out and just Googled the, the business. And basically, the Chamber of Commerce Find the company, credibility.com, landscape.com, Manta, and Yellow Page is all listed the business as Old Orchard. Could you Don't do me a favor and document that as part of information in the file? The only, the only one that listed it in Scarborough was Cotera. What is it? Cotera, C-O-R-T-E-R-A. Could you repeat those again? Uh, Chamber of Commerce. I think it's Old Orchard Chamber of Commerce. Uh, credibility.com. FindTheCompany.com, Landscape.com, Manta.com, and YellowPages.com. All list the address that we have in Old Orchard for the physical address of the business, and it says single location in all of those as well. It doesn't show another location or anything in Scarborough. The only one that I could find that said the Scarborough address was Katera.com. Thank you. Other board members' comments, questions? And if you want to take the microphone, be up at the microphone, they might have some questions for you, okay? okay. What is it you're, you're basically trying to say? I was just trying to verify the business's location and looking, looking it up and Googling it to try to figure out if there was a lot of support online telling us where the business was actually located, and there isn't really. Everything is saying that the business is in Old Orchard other than one web page. I think the question that you're trying to address is whether or not this is a business location or residence. Correct. Is that what yeah. you're getting at? Or it could also be an office for a business. Thank you. Where the, the yeah. business is doing business in one place but having the office. The address of 135 uh, Fulton Avenue Lodge is a condominium complex. I can't have a bicycle down there. I cannot have anything down there. That is strictly my home, office, fax, email. Okay. I mail everything out. I get all my mail back there. I'm, that's I'm just that's strictly why that address, that, yeah, I know. I'm just explaining yeah. why that address shows up. That's all. Right. I'm just trying to support your claim that the business has always been there. Right. And I can't find anything really that supports that. Other than everything that I supplied this evening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, can, I mean, I can see your registration. You're registering the vehicles there and everything, which is good. Well, the registering of the vehicles are actually in Old Orchard Beach. No. no. The registration is oh, in the Scarborough two, vehicles right here. Scarborough. It's in the past. Yeah, the trailers. Mm -hmm. Resident. All trucks and trailers are registered in Scarborough. No. That's that I'm that looking at the insurance form from February of this year, and it says Craig Cooler, Taylor Dunn, Old Orchard Beach, and then it says residence address of Boren Road, Scarborough. Well, yeah, that's the thing. The two trailers, and that's why I was looking at the trailers are saying Scarborough, but I didn't see the actual physical vehicles as to where those are registered. Um, what I've got here... Is Unless I'm missing your vehicles, like your commercial vehicles, I just see trailers that are red, that you supplied. Oh, I submitted the, all my vehicles prior to a 1999 dump truck before the la the meeting before the month before. So all I the probably should have brought them again. I so all the trucks that are in Scarborough are registered in Scarborough, not yes. Old Orchard. And the reason why you see that, as far as from State Farm, is they right. send the bill to 135. Right. But they asked me where are the locations of the vehicles, and I have to supply that location, and that's that's why. What, I what is 135? <clears throat> it's where my I live at there with my wife and son. It's uh, my condominium. Oh, okay. In Old Orchard. So your you, residence you, is in Old Orchard. Your business is yeah. really in your mother's uh, yes, property. Yes. At, at 223 Gorm Road. Yes. Gotcha. But I thought in the paperwork you said that you folks were living with your mom now. We are moving this weekend. Okay. <laughs> And I do insurance for a living, so I can kind of review these a little bit. Um, but it it would be more helpful if 
they could be sending that to the, the same address. You could change the address to have it mailed to the Scarborough address. It would probably help your cause a little bit because it doesn't help showing that the business is there. And residence address, when we do that on insurance paperwork, it's just where the residence is. We have two separate. We have one for the business location. We have one for the residence location that we put in. And one reason why I didn't do that is because that is, you know, that is not my legal mailing address. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's one reason why I didn't do it. I understand. So you may want to get some of those websites to tell you in Let me see if I can tear. <laughs> going to be doing business in Let me see if I can tear this down quickly, um, because I'm not sure it's as big a crisis as I think. I, I think there's an easier answer to this. Um, we. I, I, I actually buy the fact that uh, that there's been equipment there over the years. I, I don't know how much, but there's been equipment over the years. I've seen it. doesn't make it right, but I've seen it. I don't believe that grandfathering applies. Sure, that I won't bring you any further. I, one of my concerns is just that. When I look at both the 2010 and 2003 uh, pictures, I, I see very little equipment here. I don't uh, th that is what I remember uh, going back in time and asking other people that I just randomly went to. But, but here's my, my point. I don't think we have any desire to stop the business at the location. I don't think that's the intent of the, the code enforcement officer. I don't think that's the intent of the town. I don't think going back and forth over whether or not Gorham, I mean, this road or Orchard Beach, I think the issue is strictly outside storage. And I think if we keep the focus of a reasonable solution to solving the issue of what outside storage, storage looks like and define that in this specific case, which may be different than on Route 1. It may be defined differently than in, on Black Point Road because of history. We used to have a two-unit two, uh, two apartment there. So in the past, we can establish that there's a two-unit apartment there. It's not uncommon to see four cars there because you'd have a two-unit apartment, so it doesn't surprise me that those guys are there and they always were. We've had a nightmare, they've had a fire. I understand that they've tried to do the best they could with what they've had, and things are, I don't know whether or not you just decided it wasn't reasonable financially to go back to the two units. I think you stayed single family, is that right? We're actually living in the same section with my mother. She's 85, two new hips, she's fallen several times, and I will not see her in a nursing home. So that's the reason why we're moving up there with her. I respect that. I have, I have parents in their 80s. Uh, I'm the one that usually breaks things off. Um, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, uh, it's true. But is it going to be a two-family eventually, or is that the intent? And there's not a wrong answer to we're, that. No, we're hoping to do actually a three-unit. Yeah. We're going to keep the apartment the way it's always been. Ours is one, and at some point we would like to make an additional unit for my son. Financially, it's nothing but a shell, and it's going to be that way for a while. This house costs us a fortune. Okay. So, so what? Uh, if I could come to the code enforcement officer and say, when when you decided uh, that you you were you were approached, and the triggering event was the mulch initially, or was it bigger than that? Was it everything? Was it partially? You've driven by it numerous times, and obviously, if a hundred other people pulling at you in a hundred different directions, and I know that. Uh, and I know for a fact that there's no way in the world that we've approved things that are not being applied to now as we speak that we have approved um, some lots of things that I can drive down the road and show you in a minute that don't meet what we approved. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't make it right. If somebody wanted to make a stink of it, we very easily and very quickly could, and grandfathering has nothing to do with that. It wasn't approved. So the theory of grandfathering or non-approval approval is really irrelevant. It, the truth is it wasn't approved. Now, what we do have is a situation where we don't have any desire to kill a, build, a business that obviously was working at least in some form or another as a business for a certain amount of time. To me, the question comes down to being outside storage. Am I consistent with what your biggest concern is? Yeah, exactly. Okay. We were in hopes that with the larger garage that they're building that a lot of the equipment could be stored inside and that would allow him to at least continue to do the landscaping business. I personally don't see any reason why you can't pick up materials for the job that you're doing that day. I don't see any reason why outside materials need to be stored on site. 
equipment. You know if there's a trailer sitting outside, that's pretty innocuous as long as it's not plastered with a, a business name on it. Nobody's going to know whether it's for your residential use or for your business use. If your mowers and your trucks could be kept inside, no problem. It's no problem. As I said right from the start, we're not trying to kill the business. The business use is fine. It's the outside storage and the outside sales of materials that can't occur on, in that particular zone and haven't been allowed in that zone for as long as there's been a zoning ordinance. Right on, on the screen, I have the 2003 aerial photo. You don't see any outside storage. As somebody said, there's not a lot of equipment there. If there was some, it's probably shielded by these trees. So it's know. definitely escalated over the years, and maybe it comes during the busy season and then it backs off in the winter, and that's perfectly understandable. Um, so can, can you tell me what year, what time of the year that is? 12, 30, 2003. Oh, no wonder. It's right in the middle of the winter. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't have mulch out there. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> well, unfortunately, <laughs> I couldn't get Google to take a picture in September. <laughs> Well, uh, or spring. So. No, no, but I'm just saying that they were definitely that time of the year. There definitely wouldn't be a lot of this, this, this next picture is uh, May 16th of 2010, and it's really the same thing. And I would think in May you would have yeah. mulch piles if you were going to have them. No, that's not May. Well, I'm going to check this. Uh, 5, 16, 10, or 16. It looks like in 516 there was maybe one of those canvas storage buildings. Did you have a canvas storage building? Yes, I've had two carports. Carports. I okay. don't know how long, several years. Yes. So, so inside, what was inside the carport? The front one was my tractor, and then the back one was all sorts of equipment, extra mowing decks. Mm -hmm. So that's inside was storage. That's inside. So from your definition, that is inside storage. It yeah. meets the setbacks. It right. meets your definition of what you're describing from a town's, from a town, not yours, but from the town's. <laughs> See, I think we've got a bigger deal than we have. And I, I don't, I, here's what I'd suggest, and I'm going to ask the board to indulge me. I believe, number one, I can guarantee you, sir, that there's no, there's no animosity. It doesn't. It just doesn't work that way. I know it feels that way. And trust me, I built a building in Scarborough, and at one point I was ready to go chase the town manager out of town. Uh, and I built a building, and I liked him, and I was on the town council. So, so I get it. I understand it fully. But that being said, I, I can tell you that, that, that this town goes out of the way, and I've known Brian since the day he started, and <coughs> the town cares. I, I can guarantee that. What I would like to do, if the board is comfortable with this, I believe this does not belong here. I don't believe the board needs to take a position on this. I believe this is a little bit of a miscommunication that needs to be sat down with, be it with, uh, and then I'll, I'll see if Mr. Longstuff is okay with me going this path, but giving it a 30-day opportunity to maybe sit down either with Ms. Longstuff or with somebody else from his department to chat and come up with a solution that both the town feels comfortable with and you feel comfortable with. And if at that point you don't, then we can come back and have you on the next meeting and take it from there. I don't know how you feel about that, Mr. Longstaff. But I just don't see this as, I, I think we're going to get into, to, like you just said, you're okay with, you're okay with those, I don't like those, I wouldn't approve it. <laughs> so, you know, but he's telling me it's okay. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying I'm okay with it, I'm simply pointing out that there were two buildings that housed equipment. So the point being, he's okay with it, I'm not. He's, I guess what I'm getting at is, if I don't, what, what we like or dislike is not the issue, it's what the rule and the law are and what we can do and what we can do to protect your business, but at the same vein, not run into some of the other problems. And as we grow to being one of the largest towns in the community, and this will, I'll tell you, Route 1 is going to have its challenges as it comes down the road because there are a lot of violations there too. Um, we're, we're trying to do it in a way that's productive and non-disruptive. I personally believe this needs to be brought back to the planning department worked out uh, in a conference room uh, with some hot cocoa. And then if they can't get resolved, come back with what's left. Because my guess is half of it will be resolved, half of it won't. And then we can deal with what's left. But that would be my advice to the board and to uh, yourselves. You are really the only one that can make that call. 
if you'd like the table to sit down and talk with the council, I mean, with the town uh, uh, CEO, you have that right to table that if you'd like. And I would strongly recommend that because the board has to strictly go by the rules. And, yes. and, um, the only thing I would like to add is I did, when one of our meetings with Brian, I did say to him at one point, well, you know, maybe if I put some trees in and do a little fencing, and he was compliant with that. He said, well, that may be all that it takes. So I, I think there is room to talk. That would be my so advice. So I, I would agree with tabling it, and so, so be you're glad request. to we meet can't talk table. to anybody. We can't table it because there's no more information we need. So Mr. You, Chairman, before, yes. you do, yes, before you do that, you're assuming I'm okay with that, and I'm not. Okay. Okay. Well, go ahead. But, but I, I want to tell you why. Okay. All, all that Mr. Pooler is here tonight to do is to determine whether I misinterpreted the ordinance. You didn't. Okay. But we can vote so, on that as we so go. So you guys can. You, there's no need to table this because all he's here to do is to 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 say that I misinterpreted the ordinance. If you believe I misinterpreted the ordinance, then you should vote so. If you believe I interpreted the ordinance correctly, you should vote so. It doesn't change anything other than to say that I was right in the way I inter I'm interpreting the ordinance. Your suggestion to go to planning board is a good one, Not planning. and in yeah. planning board, because we we already talked to Mr. Pooler about coming to planning board board for a site plan review. That was going to entail the hiring of an engineer, traffic study. You know the routine for site right. plan review. That would allow him to perhaps propose to put some buildings, even these temporary ones. Maybe the planning board would approve that. Maybe they wouldn't. I don't know. But that site plan review. Mr. Pooler was trying to avoid site plan review because, as he's already said, they've sunk a lot of money just in getting their house rebuilt. And, and there's not a lot of funds, and correct me if I'm misstating this, it was one of the reasons you chopped, you went from a four unit down to a two unit because of the cost. So there's costs involved with getting this done legally that you were trying to avoid, and, and the, uh, the whole outside sales and storage that's not necessarily going to resolve that, but additional coverage or ways to screen or, or store your work vehicles might potentially be on the table under planning board. I can't say. I'm, I'm not the liaison to the planning board. That's Jay Chase and you met Jay. Um, but that, the, the suge your suggestion is still a good one. It has no relevance whatsoever on what the board should do with this appeal. And here's what my concern about voting on, on it is, okay, and it, it comes back to being definitions. I, I, I'll be candid with the board, and it's my opinion. I, we haven't voted yet, but I, I, if you read the rules, I, I don't know how you can argue outboard storage in an R2 zone. I, I just don't know how to, to argue that. It has nothing to do with whether it's been there for 100 years or 10 minutes. The, the rules on Outdoor storage and R2 zone pretty straightforward. Pretty hard to pretty hard to debate. The problem I'm worried about by taking a vote right now is it it could taint. Now I I have no problem with taking a position that that Mr. Longstaff was right in having this brought forward because he was. But I don't want to taint a solution by putting a restriction of that year rule, which could be interpreted by anybody in a variety of ways. And I worry about. Out, it, it takes it out of our control, and by putting it into other people's control, it could very easily be said, hey, that's been ruled on, can't have anything there, can come back and talk about it for a year. And to be candid with you, that could also be very legitimately discussed. Whereas, as Mr. Longstaff pointed out, you know, if it was a trailer, he's not going to be too wound up about it. It's not his call to be wound up about it or not be wound up about it, but he's being honest. And, and I'm trying to be honest with this too. The, my, we all want a good solution. I am worried about a finite solution at this point, where if we could get away with that. I, I honestly, on the record, and I think if, if uh, from my point of view, and I don't, I, again, I don't know how anybody, you're all, everybody has their own opinions on how you vote, obviously. And you can vote any way you want. But R2 and outside storage are pretty clear. And mulch isn't even on the list, so that has nothing to do with grandfathering. So that's why when I say I, he's right, I, I don't know how you can debate that. The question is, how do we protect the business in Scarborough while also protecting the integrity of the CEO and the process? 
And uh, that's my concern, and I'm assuming that's also your concern. Uh, I, I'm going to shut up and let the board speak at no. this point. I, I don't share that concern. Okay. Uh, I have noticed, I mean, I drive by your building all the time. I have noticed over the last year, year and a half, maybe two years, there's been much more outside storage for product. It, it's just been more. It's been noticeable. It may be the trees. It may be you've just gotten more stuff and you've just had more stuff out there. But I, I've definitely noticed it because I stop at the light because that light always seems to turn red when I'm going there. You too. So I see basically your property sitting right in front of me. And I have noticed a lot more outside storage. So I think we should vote on the outside storage and find a way to help the business store it. I mean, if Mr. Longstaff is okay with maybe one of those facilities, I think you have one of those facilities now in the back of the building that has mulch in it, don't you? But we're outside of school no. on that. Not right now. I, the mulch normally stays outside. But I don't have it in one of the... And we, we are outside of scope. The issue is strictly whether or not and this is what's the challenge about this. This is strictly an uh, administrative appeal as to whether or not the code enforcement officer read the code and handled the issue properly. The answer that I worry about is it's true. I, again, I'm one person. So this takes, takes uh, different numbers. I, 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 I don't see how, I, I how us voting on that he did do what he was supposed to do taints anything. If you guys agree with that, we can take a vote on it. Absolutely, I have no problem with it. Uh, but I, I, uh, and that's, again, your call as a board. My job is strictly to facilitate. I mean, so we're still willing to work with the business to find a way for them to do their business. It, it will be off our table. Right, it's not on our table, but the town is still willing to work with them. But he did the right thing in what he did. And it may not be that you just didn't realize that you couldn't do it, so it's not anything derogatory against you. It's just, that is the ordinance. It's, it is what it is. You just can't have anything in that zone. Mr. Chairman sure. Maroon, are you basically saying that the, you're, you're afraid that if we have a ruling that it may taint the decision of the zoning board? It, the decision of the zoning board saying that... The uh, planning board, I'm sorry. Well, I, I, whether or not this needs to go all the way to the planning board, whether need, I think that needs to be dealt internally at the... At the I don't think that's our purview. I mean, it may need to go to the planning board. I don't know. I just know that it's interpreted properly as far as I'm concerned with this issue. I also don't want to see, and, and this is where different people with different stretches of how they interpret things, and I, I live in a, in a family with two people that are, <laughs> are, are uh, uh, what's the word I'm for? literal, and two people that are figurative. I'm a figurative. My wife and I, she's a, she's a, she's a, she's a, a literal. That's why we like her so much. It's fascinating conversation. We don't so, care what political party you <laughs> <laughs> So the challenge is what I interpret is something that is very different than somebody who a literal will interpret. <coughs> I don't know who is going to walk through this process, but I do know saying he has been blocked from putting anything there per the R2 requirements is pretty black and white. And I, that makes me uncomfortable. In, un, in and again, I'm okay outside with the storage. Now, can I ask you a question? You, that garage, was that as big as it was before? I don't remember. I seem to recall it was small. The garage is nine feet wider. Higher, I mean. And, and then there's a second story on the garage that was never there. Okay, that's what, I, that's what I remember just by the building. But the actual square footage of the garage is only nine feet bigger. Do you have bins or a place to put bins inside? We've had some other people that have come before us that are doing landscaping. And what they're doing is they're putting bins inside in that garage area, and that's where they're storing their mulch and stuff. I, would not, I don't have the clearance, the head clearance for that. You know, as far as headroom, there's, there's, there are nine-foot ceilings in the garage. Actually, the bins you're talking about are cement blocks, aren't you? You're talking about the one up there. Yeah, the, the, the corral it and... and <coughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, we've had someone else that had something smaller in there. Would there be anything you could build to put... I, well, I, I could we don't want to prevent you from doing like business. a carport design where it's open in the front, yeah. and then I can, the truck can back in, dump, and put it in there, and then I can always just go in and unload it and, and, and deliver it. Yeah. I don't have actual sales at that location. Nobody comes to the door and that's purchases that's not, yeah, that's home and mulch. Point, sir. We're, just, we're just looking at the outside storage. Well, no, somebody had said at one point about sales from that property. 
And if if you read my sign, it says mulch delivered. I do not have. I'm not like Joe's next door. I don't have customers coming in all the time. I'm and, assuming and you have some, some, something. Somebody must come in though when they see the mulch and ask if you sell. Oh, sometimes they pull and ask if I sell it. But that's why I've got my number out there everywhere because in 90% of them call, <coughs> ask how much it is to be delivered. And if, but if, but if could I you feasibly you know, put it in? Put it inside. I I could I could easily put a carport over it. So one of the other buildings with cement jersey barriers to contain it. So if I may uh, interject just for a moment, uh, to say, and just for one correction, the photo we have here shows a uh, snowblower for sale sign on it um, in front of your property. But that aside, for, for for my piece, our we're not we're not uh, we're not architects and engineers on this board is what we're supposed to be doing here. Our job is just to interpret what comes before us, and. Uh, again, as pointed out, this is just an interpretation of whether the code enforcement officer was reading the code um, correctly, in which it's, as it was said earlier, it's black and white. You cannot have outside storage on an art in this uh, residential zone. Um, and obviously, it's brought up if it's inside, that's okay. So the, the work that needs to be done needs to be done outside of this meeting as far as working with the town through the due process that's currently in place with pulling the appropriate permits, uh, working with uh, a landscape surveyor or an engineer to put together a plan to um, build a structure or whatever the solution might be that's agreeable to both the town and your, and your business to uh, accommodate the situation. But right now, there cannot be any outside storage. That's the question that's on the table for us to discuss tonight. Um, everything else that sort of we're trying, we're trying, we're, deep, we're delving, delving deeper into, but we shouldn't be right now. Um, that needs to be addressed outside of this meeting. I agree. And, and I was just trying to address Mr. Maroon's concern that by us affirming that Mr. Longstaff did the right thing and is correct, that their business does have the capability. If if we do go down that road and say that this can't happen. That the business has the capability to bring it inside. So just to stop it here, yes. being a board, just to vote as to whether or not you want to vote on this, uh, as or allow for a table. I'm looking for just a show of hands or sign. What right. do you want for a right vote now. on it? Do we want to vote on this issue? Get, and who's 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 the board I'm members? I'm abstaining from this vote. You can't, believe it or not. Sorry. I think we should vote I on think it because we're have to vote on it. We, I think we should vote on this. This doesn't. Yeah. Uh, this has zero impact on anything that goes forward. This is just a yes or no. Did the code enforcement officer interpret the zoning ordinance correctly? Yeah. And we have to support them because there's there's other issues around town that yes. have much worse than this. Yes. Yes. And this isn't. We're not asking you to destroy your business or no, anything like that or, or tear it down. Of course, of course, there are just there are other ways to um, again outside storage cannot do outside storage. That's the point here, and the the description here is just whether or not the the appeal here tonight or the uh, um, excuse me the the discussion here tonight is whether or not the code enforcement officer was correct in interpreting the zoning ordinance. So let me uh, throw a motion out there. Uh, I'd, I'd like to propose we make a motion that uh, we support the position of the zoning officer. Without prejudice, uh, which gives it, it doesn't block that wall. Uh, but we take a position on the board as we support the, the position of the uh, the um, code enforcement officer for following the guidelines of the R2, not allowing TVC3. I'm sorry, TVC3. Mr. Maroon, before we do that, are there any questions or anything that we have to go through to answer on this? Or uh, no, not really. This right. is really it can. It, sometimes it allows it. Sometimes it requires it. In this case, it really doesn't. It's what does it, this is not, the sad part about this is it's very black and white. Right. And we're really reaching outside of our box to try to help you and possibly give you some ideas. But and the reason we kind of have to vote the way that we have to vote, but we're trying to give you some ideas as to what hopefully you can do. We don't want you folks to be out of business. Well, ask, by asking if you can put it inside by outside storage, and stuff, you that's, that's not really that's okay. not really our purview to tell you or ask you. But no, I just I. So what is outside storage? Has that even been determined? Is, is that outside storage? Is that okay? Or is outside I, storage not to be rude, parking a truck? Not to be rude, but just keep the... Could you state your name and address again? Uh, Kathy Pooler. 
Thank you. Same address? Uh, 135 Portland Ave. Thank you. Craig's okay. wife. Okay. Thank so you. my question is, then what is outside storage? Because I'm hearing that that's okay, those, those, car, those big, huge carports are okay, but yet I'm hearing it's not okay. Is it <coughs> parking a dump truck out front? Is that outside storage? Well, I mean, candid. believe me, we're moving in there, and I don't want to see all that mess out there. I'm going to live there now. And it's going to look a lot better than it was. So I can give you a quick idea of what outside storage was to one of the businesses in Portland, in Scarborough, if I remember correctly, this before your time, I believe. Uh, it was a landscaping company that wanted to put their vehicles on the property Route 1, and they weren't allowed to have two vehicles with their signs <coughs> on it in their driveway. That was the definition, and they have since got the property up for sale. It's been sale for a couple of years. Mr. Longstaff, would you chime in on this at all for outside storage as far as those I, I don't carport that house their lawnmowers and their vehicles would that be considered outside storage housing those those structures um, would would effectively cover equipment and vehicles. The problem is they would still need to be approved through site plan review process because it's a commercial business. Okay? So that's that's where we are. Nobody's saying that that can't exist, but it, that's a planning board decision. That's outside of your scope and mine. That's planning board. Um, that That's all I can say about that. The outside sales and storage of, of product isn't permitted in the zone. It doesn't matter what anybody says the planning board can't approve it because it's not permitted. So we're, we're primarily dealing with product. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> product would be, uh, well, I mean, no, if, vehicles if, also. You, if you could find inside storage for product, that could be okay too. It's just the fact that it's outside. Here, here's an example. This is extreme. But let's say, okay, if, if it's okay for the poolers to have the mulch outside, then what what says that somebody down the road can't start their landscaping business and they're in the same zone and they they store their mulch and then the next guy stores right. his mulch. You know, all of a sudden there's all this outside storage. You've completely decimated the whole purpose for the zoning district regulations. <laughs> so you now have nothing that looks like a planned community. You, you've effectively destroyed your district by, by, uh, by um, ignoring the rules. So there's, there's no way that the planning board could do that. And, and there's no there's no way what what this process process was about was when we asked Mr. Pooler to try to provide us with some evidence that this use had existed before in a permitted fashion before we were looking for something to hang our hat on so so we could allow it to continue but going back 22 years isn't enough it had it would have to actually have continued before 19. 58, which was the first ordinance we had, and have continued without yeah. cessation since that time. And one of the letters of support simply it was proof positive. Mr. Pooler's father unfortunately died when he was a child. So that business, I would assume, effectively kind of stopped at that point because I don't think Mr. Pooler was able to operate the business as a child. So it's, you know, it's that. Everything that I'm looking at does not give me anything on which to say that this use existed prior to the zoning ordinance. And so I'm interpreting the zoning ordinance to say, okay, if that's not, if it, if it isn't a non-conforming existing, legally existing use, then outside storage is not permitted. You, you have a motion, Mr. Chair. I, I do have a motion. Uh, I do would like Mr. Stark is going to just check something for me because the question is fairly asked, and I think we need on the record where the board is coming from. And when ask, as we go through this, to each board member, we're going to talk about each uh, position before we make a final vote. Outside storage, definitely. I'll read this from the old book. Just I want to give you an idea. And this comes up. Right, this property right on Route One. I can't remember the name of the, of the company. It's a landscaping company. It's on the same side of the road as my building. And they've been sale for three years. They actually built the building, put it all up, got all ready, did a wonderful job, remodeled the whole thing, wanted to keep their trucks there. I think it was three or more. They couldn't. They're not there. It's been sale for three years. So I can tell you that that rule taken literally, and it is taken literally on that area, is pretty restricted. Now, it's a small lot. There's a bunch of variables. Um, so I'm not going to go into the, you know, every case is different, 
But if you look at it just straightforward, outside storage, the keeping of an unroofed, uh, of in, the keeping in an unroofed area of any goods, materials, merchandise, or vehicles in the same place for more than 24 hours. That's 91. I don't know what the newest version says, but it's probably not far from it. Yeah. Um, and so the point being, again, this just comes back to why I'm doing it without prejudice, is I'm saying my motion is, is without prejudice, meaning allowing for some leniency from the planning board as they proceed to even though we are affirming the position of the code enforcement officer, we are also saying uh, that, that, there is a, that we would like something to work through that. Would you like me to read the rest of that definition? Sure, feel free. It, it, uh, actually, I'll go back to the beginning. Uh, uh, the keeping in an unroofed area of any goods, materials, merchandise, or vehicles in the same place for more than 24 hours. The term outdoor storage does not include the storage of goods, materials, merchandise, uh, inside box trailers, uh, semi-trailers, roll-off containers, slide-off containers, piggyback containers, railroad cars, or any other similar containers. Any such storage in roofed containers shall be governed by the provisions of Section 9G uh, of this ordinance, accessory storage containers. Oh, which is the industrial zone. <laughs> What's that? Which is the industrial zone. Uh, Right, so, so I guess my motion is on the table. Do I have a second on my motion? I mean, there's definitely some options there for you. Also good. Okay. Discussion on the motion. So what I'd like to do before we vote is start down, all the way down, uh, and give your positions on how you'd like to vote and why. So it's on record as to what your position is on that. I'll start with you, sir. You're not voting tonight, you. though. You're not voting, but that's okay. I think you're right. It, 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 in my opinion, this board works as a whole. There's only five members vote. Seven people are active in discussion, and that needs to be on the records. So my opinion is, I think we have gone. I think I think we've gone outside of what our job is tonight. I think. I think. If we were voting, I would I would I would vote. On behalf of the Mr. Longstaff, did his job properly. He's following the letter of the law and. And, and that's what we had to do to decide if he's done that or not. And unfortunately for these folks, I have no intention of wanting them to close down shop or for a way to resolve this that satisfies the town and satisfies the poolers. But if I was to vote on what we're here for, it's just I would say yes, Mr. Longstaff in the office has done their job properly. Thank you. I would have to agree that Mr. Longstaff has done his job properly based on the definition of outside storage in the R2 zone. Uh, I am encouraged by the reading of what outside storage is and that there are options there for things for you folks to do because it's not our intent to try to put you out of business or to hinder your business or anything. <coughs> We've gone way outside of our preview on that. Our, our whole preview for this was just to basically vote that Mr. Longstaff did or did not have the right to do what he did. and based upon the zoning in that zone, he did. Yeah, I would have to agree. I think uh, reading through this stuff, I have to empathize with you because you've got a, a successful business. We don't want to harm your business in any way, and, and we're, it's, it's, it's our desire to see some kind of a resolution to this. Um, I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the issues that we deal with is even if we were to even if we had the purview to, to allow you to have some outside storage, then we have to worry about creep. You know, maybe maybe this year you hold, have five pieces of equipment, next year you got 10, and the next year you got 13. So it, that's not part of our purview. That's that's what Mr. Longstaff and, and his staff are, are there to, to enforce. So based on what the what the regulations say, I, I would have to, to vote that yes, Mr. Longstaff was doing exactly what he is being paid to do. Well, your turn, sir. It, it, again, in this instance, like I had mentioned earlier, um, it, it's I would I would vote yes in support of the code enforcement officer because, as it's stated in the ordinance, uh, in the TVC3 district, uh, outside storage is not permitted and. Um, and also, as it was discussed tonight, out of our purview, as I say, like I said, we're not designers or engineers. Um, there are options that can be pursued through the proper channels and due process through the town that can 
uh, solve the situation. Um, first of all, it's quite evident that this business has been in existence for well over 20 years. And you could probably, if you really wanted to get to the details of it, you'd probably go back to old tax returns. That's always where the, the money hits the road. So the business has been, been there. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed that, once again, the town allowed a business to be in existence for some 20-some-odd some years and didn't really approach the problem of outside storage. Um, that being said, uh, outside storage is not allowed. He interpreted it that way. However, I don't believe that this should be going to the planning board. I think that this can be strictly a meeting between the appellant and the planning department or several people in the planning department and just figure out how can we get storage onto that property where it's legal. We don't have to go to a planning board and hire an engineer and all that stuff. Just sit down, have a meeting, understand what it is, what's out there that can't be out there, and how do you cover it up? Pretty simple. That would be my desire as well, Mr. Chair. If, well, sir. If that's possible. Well, sir. I agree with everything Mr. Blaze just said, and um, I just think that unfortunately, with the government, it kind of catches takes a while for it to catch up with you. And I agree that it was unfortunate that they ran the business for so long without having anyone kind of notice that all this was going on. I strongly support uh, Mr. Longstaff. I mean, we're here to say, did they follow the law? Is, is the law being followed? We have to follow the, the words on the page, and that's the decision that we're making today. Thank you. Mr. Blaze, would you add that as an amendment to the motion, as a friendly amendment? I can't say that it's binding, because I don't, I don't think we have that right, but I think having it on the record allows for the town to get it. In other words, I think the town needs to know where we're coming from as a board, whether or not they have to, there's no choice. Is, is uh, again, outside. But having our vote on the record without a den, your comment, um, I think brings value as they go through the process. This is my, this is my fear of why I didn't want to vote. So if you'd make it as a, as a, I would accept it as a friendly amendment if you'd, Okay. <laughs> is that able to be done? Though? Yeah, you can do anything you want to vote, whether or not it's acceptable or not. It's another conversation. Well, I just the, wanted to make sure. I just want to make sure that's not going to put Mr. Longstaff in a tough situation if he can't do anything about what we're telling him or asking him to do. The town will determine. The town's lawyer will determine whether or not that is something that can be done or not done. We're taking. What we're doing at this point is we're supporting. With we're supporting the decision as it's going to come out. The, the decision of of the code enforcement officer, but we are saying that being said, this board believes that we're still a small community and can make some intelligent decisions outside of a, of a loss of a, of, a, of a courtroom. Maybe we can't anymore, but, you know, I'd like to think that we could. <laughs> so that's why I'm saying that. And uh, I, I'd like to add one, if I'll accept that as a from the amendment, you second it. So I second it. And so we got that second. Oh, yeah. He made the motion. He made the motion, he but he had second my he had second my original motion, so he's yeah. seconding this motion, yeah. this motion. Okay. And then I'd like to add one more, that as long as immediately the uh, poolers begin working with the town on a consistent basis for a solution, up to a maximum of 90 days. The, the process moving forward, the town will take no action, uh, being fines or, or whatever, as they, and they will not add anything more, and preferably reduce um, any more from that time. That allows them to continue to do business through the summer, and not, the town, realistically, when this goes into effect, up to a $1,500 fine for a day, if I remember correctly. Um, that could be that le levy, is that correct? I don't see you doing that, but I mean, <laughs> but I believe that you could immediately do that. So I'm asking, I'm putting in as a motion, and I'm looking for that to be added to that because I don't want to see a business killed while it's in the middle of spring. I just 
So I, I would second that. I think that's a very And we do have the purview for that. All right, so that's the motion. Is that understood by everybody? It's no less than $100 and no more than $2,500 per violation per day. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't say each, each day such violation is permitted to exist after notification thereof shall constitute a separate violation. So 90 days from today. Okay. Uh, any discussion on the motion as amended as amended? Uh, Mr. Moon, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to just kind of add one thing to that. I, I, I would like to warn you that please don't think during that 90 days that you can just load the, the property up because that's not going to that's not going to help your cause with the process. You know, use the equipment, you do the stuff that you need to do to run your business, but don't you know don't overdo it because uh, we want you to. Exist in this in this business. We know you've been a, a good partner with the town. You you're in a good business, so um, do yourself some favors and try to work with the with the Absolutely. council. Absolutely. And if you can eliminate anything that's out there, great. I've actually been trying. <laughs> you saw something for sale not too long ago. I'm trying to get rid of some of it. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's something I'm not using, so of course I'm going to try to get rid of it. I think the biggest thing is showing the town how much you're willing to work with them would be very good. Absolutely. So uh, we've got a motion, and uh, any more uh, comments on the motion as amended as amended? <laughs> and re-amended. <laughs> Seeing none, all in favor of supporting the motion. That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully that will meet the requirement. Uh, I, and uh, honestly, I cannot say enough good things about this long staff. Uh, and his integrity. Oh, I mean, absolutely. So. He's doing his job. <coughs> Who do I contact? Would it be somebody on the planning board yeah. first, or just so contact Brian work. and then we'll Brian, Brian will work with you we'll to go get from you there. in the right direction. Absolutely. Hopefully, if there's any way that it doesn't have to go there, that would be yeah. great. But Thank you. I just don't, yeah. I don't yeah, I mean, know probably, yes, let's try to settle Th That's yes. going to be out of, yeah, that'll be whatever the attorney's house. At least it gives you time. I've been there 22 yeah. years. Nine more, yeah. 90 more days isn't going to make a big difference. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the time. Uh, question mark? Mm -hmm. I did tonight. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why? Okay, the next. I had a chicken sandwich. That's okay. Oh, yeah. thank you. I had a chicken sandwich and it's bright. It's my garden, Jim. I'll tell you what I want. Hi, Jim. Yeah, a few fries. Okay, Jim, you can make this easy for us. Not much. <laughs> This is uh, number two, 2575, it's practical difficulty variance requested by uh, Denise Flamey. Yeah. Uh, for Tasker Avenue, Sisters Map U22, parcel 77A. And Ms. Fisher, I'll let you introduce yourself. Seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I don't Chairman. think I've ever right. seen that. Uh, it happened <laughs> once about three years ago. <laughs> I wasn't on the board. Um, That's probably why. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, I'm Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions here this evening representing uh, the interests of uh, Denise Lamy regarding a relatively simple request, but I'll leave that to you guys to figure this out um, after a quick explanation. Uh, we're here requesting a practical difficulty variance because on Tasker Avenue in the Pine Point area, we've got uh, quite a number of houses, including uh, Ms. Lamy's, which is the cottage you see before you right now, that is essentially at grade. At the moment, there's no issue with that. Ms. Lamy, however, works in the insurance industry, uh, more particularly in the flood insurance industry, and she understands what's coming, and what is coming is going to be affecting all of Pine Point, much of Higgins Beach, a good portion of the Prouts Neck area, basically any of the somewhat lower areas of the coastal region in Scarborough and up and down the coast of Maine, the entire the in actually the entire East Coast. Uh, and what that is is, so we are told at this point we could expect um, possibly sometime around 2018 that uh, FEMA's regulations for changing the flood hazard levels or responding to the change in flood hazard levels will go into effect. Uh, that basically gives us about two years to be proactive uh, in order to, if we want to, we, we meaning homeowners in these areas, um, to raise this particular structure or raise any structures that we have to own in this particular case. We've got a, college, a, a cottage that's at grade that we actually need to raise four feet 
to get it above what's going to be the proposed flood levels according to the flood insurance rate maps that ostensibly will go into effect within the next couple of years. <coughs> we have to come to the zoning board because uh, the uh, zoning administrator is not allowed to do that on his own, is not allowed to raise or, or allow Ms. Lamy or anybody to raise it up uh, four feet high. So again, what we're trying to do very simply is uh, literally raise this house, not move it anywhere other than vertically for a temporary situation to replace in this particular case what is a timber foundation. It's basically railroad ties uh, on which this house sits. Now, it's a very small house. It doesn't weigh a whole lot. Uh, the foundation isn't bad at the moment other than the fact that it's wooden. But uh, when we do replace it, we would like to do so or plan to do so with poured concrete. Again, the reason we're here this evening is because we need permission to be able to raise it up by four feet in order to be able to get it above what's going to be that flood plain. Uh, I will leave it at that in the interest of brevity. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to address them, and I will try to answer them as well as possible. A couple of you real quick, and Mr. Uh, Longstaff will actually elaborate on some of the ones he brought up. But when somebody raises their building, and this may be the insurance people in the room, when they raise their property above the flood plain, uh, does that eliminate the need for flood insurance, or do they still need flood insurance? Uh, oh. In and of itself, it doesn't eliminate that need. It can vastly uh, or significantly decrease it, but what can be done uh, in this particular case uh, over the course of the next two years until the, it, this area actually becomes in the floodplain is to uh, bring in, we'll call it landscaping fill. We're not talking about a mountain here, but essentially what would happen is uh, if the foundation gets raised up, concrete foundation gets raised up four feet, then uh, fill can be earthen fill, which is the only thing that FEMA recognizes, uh, can be placed against that foundation. Keep in mind that uh, flood insurance deals with surficial waters. It does not deal with uh, groundwater that's percolating up through the ground. You may get a wet basement. That's a homeowner's insurance issue. Uh, as far as flood waters are concerned, it's that wall of water that tends to wash across wherever it may be, whether it's a river valley or the ocean or what have you, and ostensibly cause problems to knock a, a foundation or knock a house off of its foundation or negatively affect that foundation. However, if there is fill that is brought in or earthen materials that are packed against that foundation at typically a one-to-one -one or greater slope, then uh, that would prevent that wall of water when it comes, if it ever happens, but if it, ostensibly if it does, as it washes toward a particular uh, um, foundation to uh, hit that earthen material and basically go around it like an island. So in that particular case, there should not be any issue uh, as far as raising that up to that height to put the finished floor above that level and ostensibly because the earthen material would also be at that height or almost at that height above the flood level, then uh, and it can be certified toward that end, then FEMA would accept that. So I, I can't speak for FEMA, but typically that's but how you're it works. But you're planning on doing a LOMA to, to yes. accomplish that as a intent? Yes. <coughs> to meet the LOMA requirements. Okay. Are you planning on putting any utilities down? And yes, actually all the utilities are there now, and the utilities would, would also go in the, in the foundation which is not a problem as long as that foundation is raised and there is earthen materials around it. It will also help from the insurance perspective when you do the elevation certificate for that, it will help that the level is raised where the utilities are down there because otherwise they're going to pay a lot more on their flood insurance premiums if it's not on the elevation certificate that it's above Absolutely. the plane. There is a special act, uh, an area that uh, Mr. Crockett is, is referring to that talks about the actual lowest level. Uh, there's a lot of different lowest levels of whatever, but utilities are included in that. And yes, we would deal with that at the time that an elevation certificate would be required, which would ostensibly come at the time that the, uh, uh, the new FEMA regulations actually go into effect. Well, Mr. Uh, Fisher, the, it, in this area then, when, when you raise a house, you wouldn't be required to have it so that the water can freely flow through? You can do that. You could do anything from putting something on piles to putting uh, hydrostatic relief vents in there. Um, the issue with that is you have to have, and, and Brian can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, typically if you've got those hydrostatic relief vents, you have to be able to backfill that foundation up to a point that is no more than one foot of depth from the lowest portion of that hydrostatic relief vent, which is basically a window but doesn't have any glass in it. Um, it does have screening or what have you. It allows the uh, free movement of wind sound and water through the foundation. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but we'd yeah. be able to, uh, um, to take care of that flooding but, issue that way. So, this, so the, the, the process you're talking about is an, an, just another approved method? Yes. But okay. This, is, this well, is really important to community members, and the reason why it, it, it is a big problem. It's yeah. going to be a it, huge it's problem. That's why the state is taking such a long time. It, it, to put it in perspective, I've heard some quotes up in the range of $6,000 yeah. for flood insurance. And without Loma, 
is a letter of map amendment. <coughs> Thank you, letter of map amendment. Without that piece of paper, with the with the uh, elevations, to elevations, uh, you're you're stuck with getting that insurance. It drops values of properties. It it uh, you know, in, in its defense, it's there for a reason because the theory is you're going to be in trouble. But one of the other problems is how much of this is really about recovering losses from the last five years, which is another whole conversation. Um, so the concern that you're bringing up, and one of the first that I've seen you bring it up, in those neighborhoods, you need to talk to people about this because right now the state has pushed it off. This is a debate. Is that correct? Is that what's going on with the state? Um, it, it's a debate over how FEMA actually came up with the or used its regulations to be able to come up with a methodology that it's used uh, to be able to determine what the rising levels of sea water <coughs> are going to be and what the flood hazard is going to be in conjunction with that. And this is the third go around in the last four years. Yeah, some of that methodology was applied uniformly initially from like Key West up to Campobello and you just, I mean, there's, there's a big difference between, you know, properties in Miami and properties on the cliffs of, of Maine. Uh, and with this but one, we you also have, to do, have, you have to do the foundation because you have the utilities down there. That's why you're not just letting it free flow underneath because you already have an existing utility exactly. set up down there. Yes. And the free flow underneath doesn't excuse the insurance, correct? I beg your pardon? The free flow underneath doesn't excuse the insurance. No, it's just it's just part of the elevation. The only way to it do it. It has to be above the, the yeah, all, all the different acronyms that have to be above. So whoever, whoever's listening to this, if you know people that are involved with these areas, it's a big deal and it's going to have a huge effect on Scarborough. In Scarborough's population, for whatever it's worth. Yes. Uh, Mr. Uh, Longstaff, I think you had some comments that uh, you've written that I thought were great. Would you mind uh, any comments that you'd like to bring up? Yeah, just to clarify in, in uh, support what um, Jim was saying earlier, this is, a l this is a little unusual because currently Ms. Lammy is not in a special flood hazard area. Um, this is all in preparation for what's coming, which we're not actually 100% sure what that elevation is going to be. Right now, um, I think it's going to be 12, I think is the number. The 13. 13? AE 13. Is okay. So, so 13, which means that they're, that's the base flood elevation, which means that um, the lowest adjacent grade to the building has to be something higher than 13, and your lowest floor has to be one foot above base flood, which is 14. So it's, anyway, we, we did fix the ordinance so that if you were in a special flood hazard area and you wanted to come elevate your building, you wouldn't have to come to the Board of Appeal for that approval. We can issue that in-house now. You used to have to do that, which was crazy because you come for a hardship variance <laughs> for, a hardship. for something that <laughs> another <laughs> ordinance is saying you have to do. <laughs> so which one wins? So it was a really kind of a... a ugly situation, so we, we corrected that. We can't apply that here because she's technically not in a special flood hazard area, so there's no requirement today for her to elevate. And so that's why they're here <coughs> in front of you looking at this. I, I had concerns, and Jim, Jim had uh, mentioned, I had concerns about just how actually you're going to pick that building up and do the foundation work without trespassing on neighboring properties, not that that's the board's concern, nor is it necessarily my concern, except for when the phone rings and somebody says, hey, they're on my property. Um, so I, I'm sensitive to that. <laughs> so, so it, you know, I, I have concerns about that, um, and I did receive a call this week in, in, um, in uh, I think, I haven't, in, I don't know everybody here, but I think we're probably going to hear from, from other folks. But anyway, um, that's, that was a concern I had, um, and apparently there is an easement on one side to be able to, or an agreement from one of the neighbors to be able to access property on that side to do the work, is what yes. I understood you to it's say. It's an so informal agreement, yes. Um, again, it's not necessarily a board issue. It's certainly um, something that you may be interested in knowing about. Um, other than that, I mean, it, it's all fine, well, and good. We want folks to elevate their structures wherever there's a flood prone area, whether or not you're in it or two feet away from it, it's probably good practice to elevate. There's no point in filing for a letter of map amendment at this point because, again, she's not in the flood hazard area, so it won't be effective until she is in the flood hazard area. So, anyway, those are sort of the issues around this, and um, I think I've said enough. Mr. Longstaff, I think with your point about us knowing, 
we've always made it a point to find out how they're going to elevate the building. Mr. Fish has probably been in numerous meetings where we've asked him how he's going to do that. So that was going to be my question, basically, was how are you going to do that without disturbing the neighbors or, and, and everybody around you? Because it does look like it's pretty tight there. It is indeed. Um, what you see in your packets is highlighted, and obviously the red section in here is, is what the uh, property looks like, and then you can see mm -hmm. that on your screen. Right. Um, but uh, essentially what happens, and, and I would invite just for the future, because this is probably only the first of what are going to be many of these requests over the course of the next half a dozen or dozen years, um, if anybody uh, cares to do so, please feel free to uh, Google YouTube and go on to house lifting. Simple as that. There's a series of vignettes that would be offered. Uh, a couple of them in particular are very interesting. They're uh, stopgap motion where you can actually see in the course of about four minutes what would take somebody about four days to do. Uh, it's pretty cool, actually, if you're into the engineering facet of anything. But to answer the question, it's uh, essentially a uh, hydraulic lift, for lack of a better term. Uh, you don't actually have to use specific hydraulics, but uh, uh, it's, it's essentially unbolting the house, or this cottage in this case, from its foundation. Most houses are just bolted onto their foundations. And uh, you punch a hole in those foundations, and you actually then uh, work a beam through that hole, or through that series of holes, so that you've got a lateral lift. And then you just kind of very, very slowly uh, just kind of move this house up. But it can be done in, a series, in, in several hours, depending on the size of the structure, obviously. Now, the base support, or the base of those supports, uh, can typically be inside the area or within the foundation, but in some cases, particularly in this situation, um, and the reason we did reach out or Ms. Lemmy reached out to her neighbors is that uh, because of the, we don't know what the, uh, uh, the composition of the soils are specifically underneath. Right now, the foundation is backfilled with sand, <coughs> and uh, sand, as you can imagine, is pretty compact, so it will probably work that way, but if it doesn't, because of the proximity of one side of the structure in particular to uh, the neighbor's uh, uh, property, we did re ostensibly receive uh, permission from the neighbor to be able to go onto the property, albeit minimally, uh, to be, and the workers will have to go there anyway because we're only looking at about one foot from the closest portion of the cottage to the actual uh, closest uh, uh, property line. So we may have to work there, and uh, we have received uh, very nicely some, well, so I'll, I'll let the, her speak the about The north that. side, Jim, the north side of the property? Yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, would be on this. Uh, uh, can't get my pointer. <laughs> uh, it's on the left side. Because he's trying to get his pointer right over there. You see the north arrow up in the up in the upper right corner, so the north side is to the left. Yes. <laughs> so, Mr. Fisher, as far as intruding on neighbors' properties, that's been addressed, and there's only one potential neighbor that you would have to intrude on their property, and they've already given you permission to do that. Uh, I, I will let her speak for herself, but yes, uh, informally. There's no official easement or anything that is uh, required or requested, but obviously we would need permission to go there. And if you want, you can just take the mic. And no, um, yeah. no? Wait for a public comment. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay. So um, basically this is a uh, practical difficulty variance. What we'll do is uh, we do have one. We, we will just open. The, I'm just sort of glad it goes the other way every once in a while. Uh, we'll open the public hearing for you. There you go. Um, <laughs> it usually goes the other way. Uh, so I'll read the first one in. As president of uh, JCD Condo Association, uh, I am uh, contacting you to the appeal of uh, Denise Lammy of uh, Fort Tasker Avenue, so Scarborough. Lammy's property abuts the rears of the units which comprise JDC condos, uh, i.e. 25, 27, 29, and 31 Jones Keith Street Drive. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to inform the board that our association has no objections to uh, Lemmy's proposal and support them in their effort to complete this project. And if you'd like to take the microphone, state your name and address, so we'll go from there. No other letters of phone call. No. You give us the name and address. My name is Karen Seymour, and I, along with my husband, we own number six Tasker which is the cottage at the end of the long sidewalk. We had, a, we had a thing, if we had a pointer, we could see it probably. And this one up here. Yep. <laughs> Show me your pointer. That <laughs> lot, lot That's A. Right, right here. Okay, there we go. There, yep, there go. it is. That's number six. Okay. Um, interestingly enough, when um, cottage four, cottage six, and number eight tasks are all part of one property, they kind of all shared a communal parking spot off street and we currently share the blacktop spot 
for parking with Denise. And it's a one car behind the other car type of setup. So she can park her two cars and I can park my two cars. We almost exclusively use this as a rental property. So, and because it is such a well-constructed cottage, it is a year-round rental property for us. Obviously, the summertime is our busiest time, and I was interested to read the um, projected plan for this because I was not aware that any of this was going to take place. So when mm -hmm. I had gotten which any of this? the raising of the, the house and the doing of the foundation, I was unaware of this project until I received a letter from the town, from Karen um, Patterson, stating that there was a planning board meeting about this and it was informing the neighbors. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know. That's why we do the letters. Exactly, which I appreciate. <laughs> no, um, so I went on and managed to find it because there was a difference in the date and it said that all of the neighbors had been spoken to and everybody was in agreement and I'm like, uh, besides the other folks to the north of them, I am her closest neighbor and I am unaware of this. Needless to say, I really don't object to the raising of the cottage. In fact, I'll probably talk to you afterwards about raising mine. Um, <laughs> but it's the sharing of the parking space and it's the length of my sidewalk in front of her property. I, I am not an engineer. I am not a construction worker. I work in recreation for the city of Portland. So, I mean, that's what I do. I don't know if any of this would in any way, shape, or form impact my business in the construction um, trucks using that parking space area because, like I said, it's one car behind the other. And since it's a year-round rental property, I have three weekends already booked for September and I have a weekend booked in October. And I know that the plan was supposedly for the fall. So when that fall happens to be, I, I guess you couldn't do it when it's really cold. But beyond that, I, I guess I just want more information and some sort of, I don't know, a surety that there won't be any disruption to my business. Let's uh, put Mr. Fisher on the spot. And uh, you might want to stay there in case you have more questions. Okay. He's a nice guy. <laughs> um, as far as disruption to uh, businesses or, or to another house, obviously we wouldn't do that from a legal perspective or, or the contractor would not do that from a legal perspective because we can't deny you access to your parcel. Um, there would be so we're not we're not talking about large trucks. It's not like a, a huge vehicle typically backs up and puts the house on a uh, on a trailer and moves it aside, et cetera. Um, so this is actually equipment that usually the, the biggest pieces of equipment that we'd be dealing with as far as raising a house are the and I'll simplify and say basically it, it's the the columns are about the size of pallets, a uh, typical wood pallet, and depending on the size of any given structure, and this one's quite small, there's probably be four of these. Um, strategically placed under these beams, uh, two in the front, two in the, in the rear. And uh, they would be placed, they're very thin, <coughs> and uh, as the um, uh, house, as a house gets actually moved up, kind of like this type of thing, uh, as soon as one gets moved up, you place another uh, sliver of the pallet underneath it, and then you go to the front, and then it moves up. Uh, they're all four or six or ten or however many are required, uh, tend to move in concert this way. So instead of moving like this, you're actually just kind of going up slowly. Toward that end, the big, biggest piece of equipment that you've got is essentially about five by five. It depends on what the contractor used, but it's usually a, a pillar of about five by five uh, with very, very thin slabs, and they just keep on building it up. Uh, we've all probably seen upon rare occasion, anyway, um, houses that have been elevated. Some of them actually have been elevated to get a trailer underneath it to actually move the house. In this case, we're not proposing to do that. It would just be elevated, the foundation would be redone and then lowered back on the foundation, the house is bolted back onto the foundation and we call it good. The long answer to your question is typically uh, there aren't any large vehicles that would, uh, should anyway, not have to block uh, anybody else's uh, property or access to those properties. Uh, any of the vehicles could park uh, in where Ms. Lammy actually has her portion of the driveway. And then there's a parking area that's immediately adjacent or across the street and down just a little bit um, for any of the workmen that would be end up working there after the season, the typical the tourist season, as it were, meaning after Labor Day. What, about, uh, noise? what about noise and uh, timing? What are we looking at? Yeah, how long? Um, 
to, I'll answer the second part of that first. Timing is something of this caliber, which isn't large, could be done seriously in, in less than a week. Uh, again, I can't speak for the actual contractor. They may start and they may have off and on, and it may take three weeks to complete. I don't know that. But uh, it doesn't actually take that long to really complete the process, to begin and complete the process, especially for a cottage of this size, which is quite small. Um, and then uh, as far as noise is concerned, it's basic construction noise. Uh, there's nothing outside of what we have you know, normally heard. It's not like a jet engine that's taking off over our houses or something to that effect. Uh, but yes, there is construction noise that would be involved with something like that for a short period. And that's only during the elevation. Uh, and then obviously there's going to be a concrete uh, mixer that would end up having to back into place. The shed that you see uh, in front of the house where you did see, uh, that would be mo temporarily <coughs> moved because that's exactly where the mixer would go to be able to pour the concrete into the foundation that would be created, or the foundation forms that would be set up on site. And that's just basically building a foundation. That's usually done in a day, I mean the pouring. Absolutely. Yeah, that, and especially a foundation this size doesn't take very much to fill those funds. Yes. Does, does that meet your needs or any other questions you'd like to ask? Take the uh, microphone if you would. Yes. And again, we're not going to be able to answer everything to your satisfaction, I'm sure, but, but ask, get it out on the table so that we, it's on the record, number one. And number two, I know where he lives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all do. <laughs> I, I appreciate you asking about the noise because, as I mentioned, guests come to enjoy Maine and to go on vacation. Um, my October person, they're coming from Hawaii. They really want to enjoy the fall foliage. They want to enjoy the, the solitude of the beach. If they're going to be there and they're going to hear the construction noise, obviously I, I, would, I would have a concern. Um, had I known that this project was taking place directly from Ms. Lammy herself uh, contacting me, I would feel confident that she would keep me apprised of when the project was going to potentially take place. Since I was surprised that this was even, uh, you know, being talked about, I would like to know, is there some way that I can know in advance of when this is, when it's supposed to take place? I know that... Yeah. In, her, in her defense, this is probably something she didn't even think was an issue, um, obviously. And, but I can tell you, my, my assumption would be that Mr. Fisher can communicate probably the easiest way is to, you're going to be, are you, are you uh, quarterback in the, the process or are you just handling the front part of it? Um, this, this is pretty much the extent of our involvement. I mean, we're involved to the extent that they would like to be able to have questions and answers, but uh, we're not the contractors. Okay. Uh, you, you can get the Mrs. Lamy and communicate to her appropriately to connect up. Ms. Ms. Lammy has my cell phone number and my home phone number. She's called me for um, complaints about my renters. Okay. So I would hope that she would call me and let me know when it's taking place so I can know in advance. Do you have the dates that you have booked right now? I do currently. I do. I have uh, three weekends in, in September, and I have the weekend after Columbus Day. Mr. Fisher, would that be good to get to Mrs. Lamy the dates that she already has booked and try to see if she can work with the contractor to work? And so far, usually, I mean, the folks that come in in the fall are usually weekend folks. So if this is something that takes place during the week, it, noise on. I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, I, like I said, I have no objections to the project. I'm just concerned about my business being impacted by noise and construction and, and just stuff like that, just the, the common stuff, because it, everyone is so tight and crammed in there. If it was just a regular house, 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 I really wouldn't care, but it is when really... Are you, when are, your, when are your, your people coming from Hawaii? In October. October what? The weekend after Columbus Day weekend. And I, I have Columbus. folks that still party. <laughs> just making a joke. Who's Columbus? What date is that? Is this the 15th or something? 10th, 11th, 12th, somewhere around there. Right. So it's the following weekend. All right. And then yep. Labor Day is the second or whatever it is. That's in September. <laughs> yep. September, right. I guess it's not bad, huh? Christmas is on the 25th, I hear. In December, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so and I have folks that, I mean, now is the time that folks, when they get together with their family and friends over the summer, now is the time they start making their little plans for, you know, fall jaunts because of the fall foliage and of course Scarborough Marsh is just gorgeous this time in the fall. You know, so just I, I just like to be in the loop, I guess. That's really I don't think that's too outside the, the realm of asking. Yeah, Mr. Fisher does a really good job of relaying back what he comes to these meetings and hears for his clients to yep. let them know that 
there's specific dates that are concerns, and we can put those in the appeal as well. We can That'd actually say if they're not that the work needs to be done prior to the 15th or, or after, or done or, during or, the or week, during not the week. on the weekend. During the week, yeah. 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 And as long as I as long as I know that maybe that's kind of what they're aiming for, okay. then when people inquire about renting, I can steer them away because I I don't want them to be upset with me. I mean, I've got 25 reviews that are all five stars, and I don't want to damage that in any way, shape, or form. And you are so. the person that's given them a little bit of leeway on your property as well. Is that correct? No, this is the first I've heard of oh, it okay. through that letter. So I was okay. never approached to say, hey, can we, okay. you know. I didn't know if that was you or not. No, okay. I believe it was the folks to the north. Okay. Are you, you comfortable enough with calling her directly? I don't have any of her contact information. Don't. I gave her my information back in 2009. I don't have any of her contact information. Okay. I offered to exchange because we're down we, I live in Wyndham so we're down there more often I believe she's from out of state okay. so I had said to her I'll she, exchange information if we you have her phone number you could give it and I'll, give, I'll give you mine that'd be great it's right here fabulous. on the application yeah. that'd be wonderful <laughs> so we'll, we'll get the application and uh, get a copy thank you is that okay yeah. to meet your needs public information <clears throat> all right so let's go through the uh, the requirements oh I think they're relatively standard uh, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Mr. Fisher. Uh, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property uh, in that this site is going to be below the flood hazard level for Pine Point once the new FEMA flood hazard elevations become official. Ms. Lamy wants to be proactive and raise the finished floor elevation above the floodplain before flood insurance is required for the structure based on its existing elevation. Just from a clarification point of view, Mr. Fisher, could you say under the impre I don't want to say that once, but rather under, under the knowledge we have that, in other words, we don't know this yet. We're making uh, the assumption. Yes, we are making the so assumption. So if we could just kind of in that, because we're not, I don't want to put in something that's not. We, 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 it is an assumption. You're correct. It's, it's likely it's a reasonable to happen, one. but we don't know exactly it's when a, or how. Thanks. Do we uh, know exactly how many feet? No. Or is that up in the air? Yeah, it's kind of up in the air. Until it becomes uh, official, it's up, yeah, up in the air. Thank yeah. you. Um, the if you go to online, if you meaning anybody goes online right now and takes a look at the FEMA.gov website and takes a look at Scarborough, Maine, you'll find that this particular area of Pine Point is proposed to be an elevation, a flood elevation, maximum flood elevation of 13 feet. Uh, right now, just to give you an idea, she's not, or this cottage is not in the flood zone at 9.2 feet. So you can imagine what's going to happen. Now, this doesn't mean suddenly we're going to get all flooded at Pine Point, but FEMA, in its infinite wisdom, believes that the flood potential for a hazard is going to rise at least four feet across the, which puts the entirety of Pine Point and most of Higgins Beach. It's a nightmare into that flood zone. And in an A zone, it goes, it goes from an X zone to an A zone. The difference is, uh, it, it, statistically, in 30 years, you will see a flood, a house damaged by a flood. 25% uh, of those houses will be damaged. So that's why the state is going, yeah, nine feet, no damage so far. You want to go to 14? Come on, give us a break. So <laughs> but there's a lot of money to be made. So that's why the issue is, yep. in my opinion. But um, Mr. Blaze, you're right. We don't know exactly yet. Uh, that's just the latest information that we've got available to us. And that has been on the board for two years. We'll have to see what happens. If it, it's coming, we just don't know exactly when. Uh, so the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not uh, have the unreasonable de unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or the fair market value of the abiding properties. That is correct. The only change to the structure will be to raise the one-story cottage by four feet. And the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner? It is the result of continually rising sea levels that increase the danger of extensive flooding and the new FEMA flood elevation levels that will soon be in effect, relatively speaking, to deal with that increased flood hazard level. And no other feasible alternatives available to the applicant except a variance? That's correct. And the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties, I guess eventually. Sort of going to lead the <laughs> way, actually, but yes. yes. Uh, the granting of the variance will not have an adverse, uh, un unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. That's correct. There's no dunes or anything. Nope. Uh, well, actually, I, I stand corrected. It is in the back dune, and you do actually, you don't have in your packets, you have the unsigned 
um, DEP uh, PBR in your packets, but we actually have a signed one that uh, Karen or that uh, Brian has this evening. So that's all. The state is all set with us. Great. Great. Okay. Um, that covers those issues. Anything? Uh, I'll open the board for questions, comments, or a motion. I would vote uh, make a motion to approve appeal 2575 as appro as presented. I would second that. Um, and I would say that I, th I think that this is more a uh, more an appeal of common sense than anything. Mm -hmm. if, if, uh, if there's an opportunity to get ahead of what's what's possibly coming, then uh, to me that makes a lot of sense. And and I would kind of amend that, I guess, to put down time frames that she's able to work out um. with neighbors, if possible. I mean, we can certainly do that. I'd be it's out of our jurisdiction. The only, the issue, uh, you get into rain, you get into a lot of problems. Maybe, um, hmm. The potential problem we have with that, we'll certainly act toward that end in okay. certainly good faith, and I think I can speak for our client toward that end. We'll certainly discuss it a little bit more. Um, the problem with locking that down too much is that I've actually been back to the board several times over the past several years to ask for extensions because of contractors who mean well, but okay. something delays them and then they can't get in on a specific window we lose a window of opportunity. It doesn't happen often, but it happens often enough. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll remove it just a highly requesting that well, we could eliminate they can that to work window. with the neighbors. Your, sure. neighbor, your major concern is the people coming from Hawaii. That's the 15th. Was the date on that again? We could just what, if, what if it's a weekend? It shouldn't be any problem. But, well, we can't save the universe. What contractors work on the weekend. So yeah, we can't save everything, but if you got one there, that we can count. Like you can get Mike to work at all. <laughs> oh, it's fine. I do. So, uh, if we eliminate any work done from the 15th to the 18th, we'll get it done. You okay with that, Mr. Fisher? I can certainly pass that on to our client, who I know will pass it on to the contractor. Are you okay with the amendment? Yes, that's fine. Uh, any other discussion on the motion and the amendment? I, I, I just have one question. Uh, if I look at the at the layout of the lot, the, the cottage is really at an angle. Did you ever did you think about straightening it out a little bit? Yeah, and that's another issue. Because then you're moving. Oh, it. thanks a lot. You're moving. <laughs> I'll move it. Okay. Forget the comments. <laughs> that's a whole nother. That's something else. It's common sense. I forgot about it. <laughs> Can't use that anymore. No. Okay. I have any more discussion? <laughs> All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Um, that's more than seven minutes. Mr. Fisher, after. <laughs> you, Mr. Fisher, can you stay a little bit afterwards to discuss something with me? Thank you. Um, Anything from the board members? Thank you for all showing. It, and it and, and <coughs> makes a big difference in the knowledge base. It really is it's impressive. Uh, anybody have any comments they want to make for the... Uh, uh, step no, I'd, I'd only make one comment, and that is um, that despite the comment of one of the, the folks at the first appeal, I don't ever do anything personally. It's never personal. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last thing that I, in my job, ever enters into it. Um, so even though the perception by that individual was that this was personal, that I think Mr. Pooler is a great guy. We've gotten along great, and we've had many meetings, but it's, it was never personal. Uh, so I, can I, I can't that. operate that way. I wouldn't have a job very long. I guess that's for that. You're a straight shooter. You're blonde. <laughs> but you're, that's a nice student. part of being a straight shooter. Well, I you know something, something, but uh, I would, I would, would love working with you, and I know that you don't play those games. I truly think that, like I was saying, the the fire inhibited a little bit of this because it took away some of the trees and it took away some of the landscape that was well, hiding some of these things that were already there that people were driving by and not seeing because 
They weren't able to see it. It was hidden. That's what brought it. So I have right. Okay, hold on one sec, please. Okay, we got we got rambling here. Hold on, sir. So I have one one comment I'd like to mention. Um, yep. I may not be able to attend the September meeting. Okay. Uh, five year wedding anniversary, and I might not be oh, here. Oh. I know. See. Brian's not uh, going to be happy. Okay. I know. I'm glad I wanted to just let you know. You could bring your wife. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's I'm sure she would love, love enjoying sitting down for a few hours with us. She, she watched it on TV um, once. Do I have a motion <laughs> to adjourn? Thank you. A second on that motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Oh, amen. Thank you so much. Have a pleasant evening. He really is a nice guy.